Hello, welcome to the Energy Question with David Blackman. I'm your host, David Blackman, and my very special guest for today's podcast is Todd Snitchler, the president of the Electric Power Supply Association. Todd, how are you doing? I'm well, David. Thanks for having me on. Well, I know your uh, association is one of the big national trade associations for, for power providers in the United States. Just take a few minutes before we go into the Q&A, take a few minutes to talk about uh, the association, what you guys do, who your members are, and, and your mission there and where public policy is concerned. Sure. Thanks, David, for the opportunity to do so. Uh, as you note, the Electric Power Supply Association, or EPSA, is the only national trade association that represents independent power producers uh, here in Washington. Uh, our focus is generally federal, so our interaction is with our primary regulators at the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, or FERC, uh, but we also engage on Capitol Hill with administrative agencies. Uh, we work with our state and regional partner network on state-related issues that have federal implications and vice versa. Our members are uh, owners of assets of all types, and their footprint stretches from California to Texas to New England uh, with all the areas of the country. Every restructured market in the country, our members have assets. Our generation portfolio uh, across all of our members is predominantly natural gas these days, uh, but still uh, includes natural gas, coal, nuclear, hydro, battery storage, wind, solar, um, and even some hydro. So we have all, all resources in our mix. And so, you know, some have accused us of, of being the uh, fossil only uh, generation uh, organization. Uh, and I think we can dispel that notion right here at the top. Yeah, it's, it's kind of hard to be fossil only these days. <laughs> That's for sure. Yeah, I think, uh, I think the federal government's pretty much done away with that ability. Um, but, you know, so let's just start with a general question. Sure. Uh, in, in your view, how would you describe the current state of reliability and resilience on America's various regional power grids? I think we are well positioned to maintain historically high levels of reliability. And my one caution that I would put around that is that the North American Electric Reliability Corporation, or NERC, they're the uh, reliability coordinator for the entire uh, North America, it's not just the United States, has highlighted a number of regions of the country that are potentially looking at issues with regard to reliability, and it's primarily around generation resources. So it's not as if we don't have sufficient wires to move electrons. It's are we retiring certain resources that can generate electricity on demand or dispatchable is what the term we would use. Right. Uh, and are we moving too many of them off the grid too quickly and replacing them with intermittent resources or non-dispatchable resources that have energy potential, but are not good capacity resources. Uh, and NERC has made it very clear that we are in the middle of an energy transition. I'm not sure I love that phrase. I think we're more in a <laughs> period of energy expansion for a couple of reasons. One, uh, we are starting to see low growth in the United States, and we have not had low growth for probably 15 years, uh, but we are seeing increased demand. There are policies across states and now the federal government that is looking to expand electrification. And if we're going to electrify the economy, whether it's transportation or buildings or industry, that's going to mean an even more significant increase in electricity demand. And that's going to require that we have sufficient resources to get there. So uh, we're not of the mind that you can retire the old fleet and just add new, new resources to the fleet. We're going to have to have what we have and more. That's the expansion part. And that fleet's going to change, and it has changed over time, and that's historically been the case. Um, right. But I think we need to be very careful about how we go through the transition process or the expansion process, because if we get things out of alignment and we retire certain resources too soon before there are sufficient resources to replace them, you are, you're slow walking yourself into a very avoidable reliability problem that no one wants. Yeah, and, and when you talk about uh, uh, increasing demand for electricity and, and these efforts to electrify everything mm -hmm. happening in California and, and other states in the country, just yesterday, EPA uh, issued a proposed new regulation on mileage standards that's going to basically make most gasoline-powered automobiles illegal just in nine years from now. Two-thirds of the fleet's going to be impossible 
to produce anymore. That's going to create an enormous new load Correct. on the power grid, right? right, for the recharging of all these electric vehicles. Uh, and the Biden administration appears to believe we're going to be able to re- to to meet that demand only with renewables. Is it, in in the view of your membership, is that even possible thing to achieve? I think, given where technology sits today, our answer would be no. But it's it's not. There's more nuance to that. And so, what yeah. I mean by that is. We, as you see the generation resource mix change, and you're right, there is a there's a serious drive for more renewables to come onto the system, and the uh, IRA uh, legislation is certainly encouraging more and more of that development. But as you look at the reality of grid operations, you're going to need additional resources that are quick start uh, ramping, can ramp to meet yeah. load. Natural gas is uniquely qualified to be able to meet that need. Because when the wind doesn't blow or the sun goes down and you don't have sufficient battery storage, which we don't today, in order to you know power the grid overnight, you need resources that can come on. So the operational profile of some of the resources we have today may be different. It may not run 24 hours a day, seven days a week. But boy, when it needs to run, it is going to be mission critical to keep the lights on. And I like to say that there's three things that Americans want. They want lights on, beer cold, and water warm. Uh, And that's non-negotiable for uh, American society. And so I don't think the public is going to be willing to have anything less than near perfect reliability. And so we have to be thoughtful as we look at if you're going to make certain decisions, you're going to have to acknowledge that there is a need for resources that may be disfavored by some groups, uh, but are the keys to keeping the system reliable. And I think we need to keep that in mind as we make policies, both at the state and federal level. Yeah, and 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 so at the state level, I'm I'm here in Texas, mm-hmm. and of course I I was without power for four days during winter storm Uri a couple sure. of years ago, and yep. and uh, we had 300 Texans pass away during right. the blackouts that that happened during that storm. Uh, the legislature right now is looking at dispatchable thermal capacity that you mm-hmm. just you know that is the remaining big Kahuna weakness. I think in our state's power grid, and and we have a proposal that was passed by the Senate that would uh, incentivize the building of about ten gigawatts of of new capacity fired by natural gas. Mm-hmm. Um, there's it's questionable whether that'll get through the House of Representatives. Nobody knows yet, but I wonder what uh, the position of of your members is on a proposal like that that would, you know not be a mandate, but set up a competitive bidding process for the building uh, of all this this new capacity to to be essentially reserve capacity for the grid. How do y'all look at that? Yeah, we look at it from the perspective, and I should say up front, we we do not engage in Texas because it's non-FERC jurisdictional, but certainly Texas is a bellwether for how our markets may be going to perform. We look at this situation and say, our members are willing to invest the capital where market signals suggest that investment is needed. And they are very resistant and we are not supportive of captive customers being forced to pay the bill for resources that the market would otherwise provide. And I say that because, well, for two reasons. One, it encourages better spending discipline. When you remove the, you know, I make more money when I spend more money, that's usually not a good thing for consumers. And that's kind of the (laughs) traditional utility model. But on the other hand, it shifts that risk on those better able to manage it and bear it. And that's the investors and shareholders of those organizations. If you tell our members, we need this type of resource, and we're going to give you the opportunity to earn a rate of return and compete in order to deliver power to customers, they will invest the money to deliver those resources where you have the state step in and say, we're going to predetermine who will win and we're going to predetermine all these other uh, specifics. It usually means that that works out well for the the chosen beneficiary, which is what we see in Washington quite a bit. And that doesn't really empower market participants. So our, our position at EPSA is if you properly design the market and you give people certainty, they will make the investment decisions that will give you the reliability that you're seeking. And of course, you know, that's been a problem on our grid is that the market signals haven't been there that's to build that capacity because of the way it's been structured. And there there are proposals to, again, uh, enact some reforms to how the market functions and that will hopefully mm-hmm. 
you know, uh, create those market signals. And, and so, yeah, that's really the kind of uh, competing ideas that are happening in the that's session right. right now. That's so right. It's, it's a real uh, interesting decision point for the legislature to make. Um, another story that came up, and I always try to relate what's my these interviews are going to be to things that are happening in the news right now. Sure. Yesterday, there's a story out of China that they're doubling down on coal again in China. And of course, one of the big goals, I think, for both the Obama and Biden administrations has been to uh, make it essentially impossible to build new coal fire capacity in, in the United States. And it, it seems to me, and I wonder what your view is, that they have basically uh, succeeded at this point. It's, it's pretty much almost impossible now to build a new coal fire power plant in America, isn't it? I think you. I think it's uh, almost certain that you have, you will not see new coal fire generation constructed. In fact, that's the units that are retiring most quickly now. As we see the turnover of the energy system, it's the older, less efficient, higher cost coal units that are retiring and are being replaced by either highly efficient combined cycle natural gas, renewables, and battery storage. But I, I cannot think of one example where there is an active. Uh, coal application for a new power plant anywhere in yeah. the United States. Yeah. What about nuclear? Is there any, are you seeing any uptick in interest for building new nuclear power since it's a basically a zero carbon emission uh, uh, generation source? Yeah, I think there's two schools of thought on nuclear, at least from where our members sit. And our members own nuclear, so we're, we're certainly in favor yeah. of nuclear resources. But you you have the project in Georgia that is over budget and years late that has really caused a lot of consternation about the traditional large single unit or dual unit reactors. But there is a lot of interest in the small modular reactor concept. And right. there are billions of dollars that are chasing uh, what will ultimately be the, hopefully the standard for small modular reactors. Uh, the challenge is what's the timeline on that? You know, we've been looking at small modular reactors for a long time. There's certainly renewed interest in trying to do that. I think there's every incentive in place to be able to deliver it. But it's been 30 years, probably at least, that we've been looking at small modular reactors. <laughs> so we're hopeful that it comes, but you can't plan your grid around what may or you know may be reliable or may be available in the future. You've got to plan the grid for where you are with an eye on where you're going. And certainly we hope that that'll be part of the mix. But as of today, there's not even a test project that's putting power onto the system that I'm aware of. Um, and we've got some significant hurdles to get from where we are to where those will be commercially viable. But certainly right. we'd be supportive of when they work and when they're commercially available, our members would be supportive of utilizing them. It's just a question of when will that be and at what cost? So let's let's talk about... Uh shift gears a little bit here and talk about the transmission piece of things. Sure. You mentioned earlier, there's plenty of wires right now to, to move the elect the ions to the markets. But as we expand and, and with these plans, this Green New Deal public policy that's in place now, it's contemplating an enormous expansion in, in grid capacity. That's right. And that's going to mean, it's going to have to mean a big expansion in uh, the number of transmission lines, right? You're going to have right. to have a lot more wire, wires to move all that electricity. Uh, is the industry prepared for that kind of expansion at the moment, both just from a, an investment posture and also a public policy posture? Yeah, you raise uh, a couple of really important issues. The first of which is it's not it's not free to build that infrastructure. Uh, <laughs> oh, and consumers, consumers are going to be on the hook to pay for that. And so we need to be mindful about how much that cost will be. Um, but you also raised the other issue, which is, can it be done in a timely basis? And where is it going to go? Because we've seen opposition to fossil or natural gas pipeline infrastructure specifically over the last 15 or 20 years that's effectively stymied a lot of that development. And you've got a number of folks on the other side of the equation who don't particularly like the transmission lines and may oppose them for reasons that are mirror image to maybe those who oppose the pipelines. And so I think we're going to have to have a conversation, and that's what the siting reform discussion is about in Washington right now, is if we're going to add some of these resources, you are 100% correct. We are going to need more transmission in order to do it. 
but there's a way for us to do it and that we could introduce competition to transmission that's been done in some parts of the country and that's actually proven to be very effective. It has reduced cost and delivered uh, outcomes at or ahead of schedule, which is what you would want if we're going to have to time all these things to be correct. But we are running into workforce related issues. There are supply chain related issues that are important for us to consider because if you merely passing a statute or passing a law that says, you know, this shall happen. But if you don't have the people that can build it and the equipment to do it, you're going to miss your timelines. And you're, again, you're, you're walking yourself into a reliability problem that you could avoid if you were more thoughtful in your process. Yeah. And supply chain is a, is a big issue right now, isn't it? I know that, that we have a pretty significant concern right now, particularly where transformers are concerned right um uh particularly you know especially now we're about to go into hurricane season and i I wonder what your view is if if we're ready if we you think we have an adequate supply of transformers on end number one uh and if we have the supply chain secured to get you know those transformers that we're going to need for the future expansion yeah, you you raise another important issue, and I know that a number of my colleagues at different trade associations similar to ours have raised, which is there are real concerns about both the inventory that exists and the ability to get additional transformers. Um, hurricane season is always a source of concern. The utilities have a very sophisticated network of mutual assistance, and they help each other out. But when your shelves are bare because you're trying to maintain your own system, and then you know one of your peers says that we've had a storm impact our infrastructure and we need you know additional transformers and they're not available, that's that's when the rubber meets the road. And I think we are at the point now where we need to pay some really serious attention about our supply chain. Should we be building those in the United States? What is the actual inventory? You know, the timelines I have heard for the smaller uh, transformers are up to two years. And for the large transformers, it can be up to five years. I mean, that's if you have a significant weather event or you have a significant outage, or frankly, if you have damage like we saw in North Carolina late last year or in Washington state or Oregon after that, um, that is that's a flashing red light about the need for us to make sure that we are thinking about the complete uh, energy value chain, which includes the transformers and some of the system requirements that can be damaged either through weather or through human action, vandalism, criminal activity, what have you. Um, We can't afford to have those not be available because without them, you can't move your energy. And without energy, the public doesn't have the lights on, beer cold, water warm. And that's just not an acceptable outcome. Yeah. And and the security you mentioned is is also been kind of a a growing issue. It seems. I mean, we've had this spate of of actual attacks. I mean, people yeah. even shooting at central facilities uh, with guns to try yeah. to to shut electricity off. Um, uh, what? But what about your members with their their installations? Are they seeing similar kinds of issues happening at you know at a power plant facility? Yeah, we have not seen the same type of activity at a power plant, partly because of the way it's situated. It's a little different than, you know, you look at your uh, traditional substation or, you know, even if it's a a larger substation, they're generally in rural areas. They're out in, in the unprotected in many ways. Uh, and that's that, that's not a state secret. I mean, you can drive down right, the highway yeah, and do that. Yeah. Um, and that's where they're potentially more exposed. A power plant is generally behind the fence, uh, not easily gotten into. But you you see routinely where um, people are just even if it's for theft reasons, trying to get into power facilities, whether it's a substation or a power plant, looking for copper, looking for copper, things like yeah, yeah, recycle. And you see reports of that almost daily, where somewhere in the country those kind of things are happening. Um, and and you have got the full attention, I think, of the, the sector, but also our regulators about what are we doing to ensure that we are properly protecting um, all of those assets. Uh, I know that there is at least a couple of states that are looking at, should we harden every substation? And of course, that could that be done? Probably. Is there going to be a significant cost to do it? Absolutely. <laughs> so at some point, you have to do some risk uh, calculations about your cost benefit. There are some resources right. that you wouldn't want to spend substantial amount of money. Maybe it's as simple as putting some cameras on it so that you can see who's coming and going. The other is if you have a very substantial substation and you need real protection and a lot of attention paid to security, then you would treat that differently. And so there's 
there's already a gradient that utilities utilize in order to determine how they're going to protect that infrastructure. But there's an even more heightened attention on that now, given some of the criminal activity that we've seen over the last six months, but really has been going on in the background for several years now. Yeah, I, you know, you talk about uh, the number of, of those those kinds of facilities, I mean, I mean, tens of thousands That's of them correct. nationwide. I live in a kind of a, a semi-rural area just south of, of Fort Worth, Texas, and and I drive by half a dozen of them every yep. day, almost. Yep. Uh, they're just all over the place out here. And uh, to think that you could harden every one of those uh, in this country uh, the cost would be in the tens of billions, uh, if not hundreds of billions of dollars. Yeah. I, I mean, it's just uh, an enormous potential cost. I think that's exactly right. Yeah. So you know, and then then of course, your members also have to worry about, uh, in addition to those kinds of security issues, cybersecurity. That's right. And uh, talk about the kinds of, of, of measures your guys have sure. to take to protect against those kinds of attacks. Yeah, the, the cyber issue has been an ongoing issue for quite a while, although really when the Ukraine war started, it really kind of raised the issue uh, because of people seeing firsthand what was being done to their electric infrastructure via cyber means and what have you. And certainly, you know, our members and our utility brethren and public power and the rural co-ops all kind of adopted our shields up mentality to say we have to be hyper vigilant because we don't know if someone's going to try to create havoc here in the United States. So I think if you take a step back, even before that, you know, the financial sector is the one that everybody pays attention to because we care about our money uh, and they have cyber attacks every day, just like we do. But the power sector has, has exponentially more attacks, partly because of the surface attack surface is so much larger. Um, but there are, there are bad actors. There are, you know, people in their basement, just, kind of scanning the grid for fun, uh, who are all looking for opportunities to create problems. Um, and certainly our members are actively engaged in being um, very aggressive in our defense of their own systems, but also how the system fits together. Uh, EPSA, as a, uh, as a trade association, is a member of the Electric Sector Coordinating Council, where industry partners with the government, uh, including DHS and all the agencies that address cyber and physical security in an effort to make sure that we are sharing information and that we and they have the best information available about what risks may be out there, how we can best work to protect against them. Um, and we have to do that on a hourly and daily basis because you know the bad actors, uh, it's much like a traditional terrorist mentality, they only have to be right once, we have to be right all the time. And so we take cyber and physical security very seriously because the impacts on the power system are potentially devastating. As you noted, in a winter storm, it's a problem. But if you have the power go out for three or four days, even in a non-severe weather uh, situation, you can't yeah. charge your phone, you can't charge your car, you can't you know, cook your food if you're electrified in your house and you don't have natural gas to be your, your kitchen or what have you. It creates real issues that impact Americans on an hourly and a daily basis. And so we work uh, along with our utility colleagues to try to prevent that from happening as much as humanly possible. And so far, we've had a pretty good track record of success, and we hope that that's able to continue based on the energy and money that's being invested to protect the infrastructure. So you mentioned earlier that, uh, it, and, and I agree with you, by the way, you, you said that uh, you don't like that term energy transition because what we are really seem to be embarked upon here is more of an energy di diversification and an energy addition where mm -hmm. we're adding a lot of new sources of energy. But that, doing all that, it, it increases the complexity of all this and puts all this new pressure on the grid managers to manage all of that. You know, talk about the kinds of challenges that grid managers face today sure. that they didn't face 25 years ago in trying to integrate all of this into a stable grid. Yeah, I think if you look historically, you had central station generating resources that were fairly large, uh, yeah. and you manage your thousand megawatt coal plant or your thousand megawatt nuclear reactor or your thousand megawatt natural gas facility uh, that would be the main sources of generation to come on the system and you dispatch it and you keep the system in balance and everything works you know, swimmingly. Now you have 
uh, a number, uh, and it's it's in the hundreds and in the thousands of resources that are putting power onto the system. And technology has evolved to enable that to happen. But because of some of the differences in technology, inverter-based resources, so solar resources that operate differently from a traditional spinning reserve like you would have in a coal plant or a nuclear facility, create operational challenges that have to be managed through technology and through system analysis that the grid operators have to do. In addition to that, they also have a what's called their interconnection queue, which is all the resources that want to come onto the system. They have to study what the impacts will be and go through a process. There are literally hundreds of thousands of megawatts that are in the various queues across the country for projects that are trying to figure out if they can you know, pencil out and make investment sense in order to come onto the system. And the grid operators are having to model and evaluate what all of those projects look like while on the other hand, they're monitoring and making sure the existing system runs, they're trying to figure out how we're going to add certain resources, where they will be, will it create system constraints for transmission or distribution? Are you going to have a older facility that retires as a result of some of these new projects that come on? Is there the ability to even put energy on at a certain point? Does that trigger the need for additional transmission or distribution infrastructure? So there's a lot of engineering that goes on. And this is, of course, the biggest machine in the world, the North American electric grid. Yeah. Uh, and 99 plus percent of the time, it works really, really well. But that's because of the great work that's being done by these folks. But it is being complicated by the addition of different resources. And they're managing it. Um, I think they're managing it fairly well. There are those who say the process is too slow. We're not transitioning you know, to resources that we prefer fast enough. And I think that we have to be very mindful about making this an effective energy expansion and not one that's driven by, and, and I say this as a recovering politician, we all like to have ribbon cuttings in our district. And that sounds great when you are able to announce a new project, but all of that has to fit together in a way that doesn't jeopardize reliability and the system can take it on and then manage the exit of the resources that are leaving as a result of economics or retirement decisions, what have you. And there is a way to do it right, and there's a way to do it wrong. And if we do it wrong, we jeopardize reliability. And as I've said, hopefully enough times now, that's just not acceptable, and the public won't stand for it. Yeah, and you know, and if you jeopardize reliability to to the extent uh, to where you have a situation like they've had in Pakistan or you know, one of these developing sure. countries with power blackouts every day, modern life is essentially unsustainable at that point, right? Yeah, I mean, there's a utility executive that. That, I, that I often quote who says, you know, electricity is really important. It's the first 7% of the American economy. And without that 7%, the other 93% doesn't work. Yeah, that's right. That's I may steal that quote. I might have to steal yeah, that quote. Yeah, you can attribute that to Tom <laughs> Fanning from Southern Company. That's who said okay. it first. Okay, that's a great quote, man. We are we are fresh out of time here. We're bumping up against it. I really appreciate you doing this. Well, this thank has you, been David. Fantastic. This is a great conversation. And hope to check in with you again sometime soon. Would love to. Anytime you're available. All right. Well, and thank you all for joining us. Thanks to the Sandstone Group for hosting our podcast. To our extraordinary producer, Eric Perel. I'm David Blackman, and that's all for this time. We'll see you later.